hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Tom Flick, who is up in Redmond in Washington. How are you doing, Tom? I'm doing fine, John. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and this is a first for me. I haven't had a former NFL quarterback on the show before, so this is this is a, a great uh, a great thrill here. Um, Tom, who played for a number of uh, some of the best known teams, the Redskins, the Chargers, the Jets, uh, and then um, transitioned into um, you know leadership and and being a, a keynote speaker and working with Harvard uh, professor Dr. John Cotter on on. A extensive research around leadership. So today I wanted to talk to you, Tom, about, about what does leadership really mean? Because, you know, people sometimes uh, confuse the concept of a leader with what leadership really is, right? Well, lots of times, John, that's true. Lots of times we end up leading the way we saw one of our peers or a parent or a coach or a teacher lead us. And so we're really kind of confused about leadership. And I teach the distinction between leadership and management and really I'm talking a good deal about the actions and behaviors, not the title of leadership mm -hmm. or management. And so it's really a point of distinction that really has um, changes the outcome of how we do business today in the world. Leadership is essentially vision and strategy. It's communicating vision and strategy. It's motivating action. It's getting buy-in. It's removing barriers. It's essentially taking complex systems and people and creating innovation opportunities and growth. So it's a great thing. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are overmanaged and underled by a factor of four to one. So we're on the teeter totter of being managed more than led. Mm -hmm. That's created some issues uh, in corporate America today. And and part of the problem, obviously, Tom, is that you know people get promoted and um, they get promoted higher and higher in an organization, and and some of them maybe have innate excellent management skills. Some people may have innate leadership skills, um, but they're rarely really uh, explain the difference, but prepared for what the difference is, right? It's so true, John. Yeah. I mean, I, I deal with a lot of leaders who are managing. Mm -hmm. And so they'll say something like, they'll use terminology or words like controlling instead of aligning. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so or planning instead of visioning. And so management, the opposite of leadership is budgeting, staffing, uh, controlling, smart problem solving, planning. Uh, Henry Ford did us a great favor by perfecting management. The issue between <laughs> management actions and leadership actions are that management doesn't move you forward. And if it does, it moves you forward very slowly. And in a world that's changing so fast and, and uh, with globalization and a flat economy and the way we communicate and technology, we need to lead more than manage. We need to at least level the teeter-totter mm -hmm. out, so to speak. And so mm -hmm. that's the big issue that we have. And I guess part of the problem is that in many in many organizations, the position that you're in um, may require you to pivot between leadership and management, right? And and that's a, that's a difficult balancing act, right? It is. And I think, you know, people ask, is leadership innate or is it, can it be created in people? And I think it can. I've seen that happen before. Good managers become good leaders. It's just, it's the awareness of what that is and what that looks like. And, and really, what are the obstacles that get in the way of leadership? And I know that this is a sales pop and you have mm. lots of salespeople listening, but I think leadership is the ultimate, or salesmanship is the ultimate act of leadership, if you think about it. Yeah. I mean, to be a very good salesperson, you need to have self-leadership and what that in entails as far as these actions, behaviors, these thought processes, and then also the obstacles that get in the way of preventing great leadership from taking place. And, and I love what you just touched on there, and I think it's a really incredibly important point, is this idea of self-leadership, because I think that um, uh, that's, you know, it's like accountability, like everybody thinks that accountability is a good thing, but they think that it starts with someone else, right, rather than with yourself. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit more about self-leadership, because that, that, that for me is a, is a core concept, and you can't be a true leader without being a self-leader first, can you? Well, yeah, I don't think you can, really. I think that's something you need to, to develop in yourself if you don't have it already. And if you do need to exercise it to agree that you, you, know, you strengthen the muscles, the leadership muscles. But first, there's a couple premises that I go mm. by. And I think because the world is moving so fast and changing so quickly, that number one is leadership is the name of the game. I, I really believe that because we're overmanaged, as I said, and underled. Mm -hmm. So we need to lead. Secondly, the speed of the leader determines the rate of the pack. How fast you move or how fast you can get your team or sales team together 
to jump through a window of opportunity that opens and closes so quickly mm -hmm. in today's environment that, you know, that's cri critically important. I think leadership also is the process of engaging the head and the heart. I think I go to too many sales conferences or leadership conferences or meetings that I speak at around the world. And the big issue I find, John, is that they make it an intellectual exercise. Right. So there's a great emphasis on ROI and metrics and analytics and those types of things. But if you really want to be the world's greatest bank or the most compassionate hospital or the most service-oriented hotel, uh, feelings are more influential than thought when it comes to affecting change and impacting change. And so we need to kind of uh, certainly appeal to the brain but we also certainly need to appeal to the heart, and that's a big part of leadership. Yeah, and and I think that I think you touched on a, another critical point here as well, because obviously we're in the era of, you know, big data and analytics, and we can analyze the heck out of anything we want to, right? And we can gather all of these data, and we can we can put up charts, and we can pour over charts. But you're correct; all of that's well and good, and has its place. But at the end of the day, and especially in sales, it still comes down to some level of human connection, right? It really does. I think people have been bombarded with sales techniques and so forth. And you have to have some part of that honesty or transparency or authenticity that comes from the heart inside out that then allows your communication skills and your ability to sell the products and services that you have to a higher degree. I mean, you know, we buy from people we like, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we we care and work hard for people that care about us. And so it's it's not difficult. It's not hard math. But it's amazing how little that you know people put emphasis towards that. So when you work with people, right, and say uh, you know you work with a, a group of people or an individual, and they really believe that they don't have any leadership qualities at all, like you know they say oh, I'm just a follower or whatever. How do you help people understand or draw out those leadership qualities that they may have? I, I just find that I don't. I think most people, uh, John, just don't realize the scope of leadership and what it is. I think it's a topic that's kind of never ending. I don't think you come to a certain mm -hmm. conclusion that I've figured leadership out. Leadership is little things. It's big things. It's uh, it's being nimble. It's being agile. But for that person who's sitting there thinking, I don't have these skill sets, I believe that they can be learned mm -hmm. more often than not. I don't think it's just left to those people that are born with it. So, so it's a matter of letting them understand what it looks like, how it responds, how it reacts, um, most of it is, um, uh, it's kind of command and control or it's micromanagement. Why is because I saw someone else do that in my life and, and that must be the way you lead because, you know, and you can get things done being a micromanager or mm -hmm. command and control. Um, you probably can garner a lot of respect in the process of doing that, but people never love you. <laughs> people never give discretionary effort to go extra mi an extra mile for you. Those types of things are really critical in a very competitive environment that we live in today. So develop these, these leadership skills and traits is really paramount for us having success in all different fields and in, in endeavors that we're part of. So is part of leadership uh, having the confidence to let go of things? Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah. I mean... Um, Micromanaging never, because what you do is you take leadership away from people. Mm -hmm. You want people to have autonomy, and that's why you've probably had someone in your in your service or on your team or so forth that will do the things you tell them to do, but they'll never do the things beyond that that are mm -hmm. visibly uh, right in front of their eyes that they should see and should take on, but they don't because they're waiting to be told what to do. That comes from micromanagement or command and control. And so we want people to actually grow in their leadership abilities. And so one of the things I speak a lot about is the leaders. I call it the leader's voice. I think, you know, if you think about words are simply tools that predict and perpetuate the future, how well someone speaks and how well they use their words. And I think leaders, I think they have a different vocabulary. If you just pay attention, you know, mm -hmm. put your antennas up for you and your listeners for the next two or three weeks. And someone you really admire who's a leader, you'll find they speak differently than most people. And so they use words and they use them carefully to, to create pictures in the brain, feelings in the heart, which enact and enable, uh, you know, what behavior changes and, and, uh, and attitudes that allow us to move differently through the world. So uh, that's a big part of it. So um, can you uh, g give some examples of where, you, you know, in the work that you've done, where you've seen these changes happen in organizations or in individuals? I mean, you don't have to name them, but but just give give an idea to some people like where you've taken people from and to. Well, I speak in all different 
mm -hmm. industries. I could be in aerospace or technology or uh, healthcare, pharmaceutical, retail, hospitality. The one universal thing is leadership, right? Mm -hmm. And if, it, if you have a leadership challenge, typically it's going to be the same, irregardless of what industry you're going to be in. And so what we find is that we find a lot of legacy in organizations that people used to do things a certain way. We've done it this way for 25 or 30 years, but these young kids are coming in mm -hmm. and they want things done faster and they want things done. You know, they want to have skin in the game. They want to be part of the process. They want to have decision making access. And so this kind of flips the switch for a lot of people. And I find that that's really the challenge that I see taking place in most organizations I work with is how do we gather our teams together? How do we get them to function and engage better? And how, we get, how do we get them to you know, deploy and implement strategy faster? Well, it comes from leadership. It's going to come from relationship. You can't manage that, really. It needs to be a process of leading that. And so... Um, so it happens in all organizations. I'm working with an aeros, uh, defense, aerospace defense organization. It's one of the biggest in the world. Uh, I'll be speaking to them at the end of the month, but had a conference call with them just recently. And it was the same type of issue that was being taken place in their organization that happens in maybe a retail place like In-N-Out Burger. You right. know? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you're selling missiles or creating missiles to defend our, our nation and you're selling hamburgers to make people happy. Same challenges still show up. And so um, it's really interesting, but I th I'm a firm believer that you have to figure out, John, what causes, I call it stop, what causes mm -hmm. people to stop? What, because you can't really implement, here, here's a value, here's something you need to implement. You need to first find out what's causing the pain. Mm -hmm. You eliminate the pain and then replace it with the right behavior or action. And so one of the main issues that I find that uh, prevents People moving forward, people from growing organizations, I think it's really the number one reason why organizations don't grow is this um, idea or concept called complacency. Right. And if you understand complacency correctly, the definition would be it's a sleepy, steadfast contentment with the status quo. Mm -hmm. So basically it says what I'm doing is just fine. Mm -hmm. What people need to know about complacency, though, it's, it's not malicious, it's not intentional, it has nothing to do with laziness. It's just where the brain goes after you've had success. And it's based on past success, anecdotal success, historical success. This is done by research by Dr. Mm -hmm. John Carter from Harvard. And they found that just people, hey, I'm, I'm pretty good just the way that I am. Right. And so we never can keep up with the speed of change because we're, we fall back into what he calls it a managerial mindset. Isn't, and, isn't it kind of interesting, though, that we're – I mean, complacency and we, we when things are working and they're smooth and they appear to be OK, you know, that complacency, we're very comfortable with that. We don't really like change. Um, we don't you know, we don't want anything upsetting like the status quo. But the reality is life isn't like that. And, you know, and regardless of whether it's business, like our lives are never like our lives are never uh, are never, you know, static for any length of time. But yet we seem to try and create that kind of static phase within work. We do. We actually do. And once we create it, we defend it uh, desperately. <laughs> Uh, I've been into some tech companies that are king of the hill, but I got to tell you, they're some of the most complacent companies sometimes because they are. They've had success over a long period of time. And, and it skews how we see the world. It skews how we partic participate in the world. And so what happens is after a period of this complacency, you're going to find competition moving past you mm -hmm. so quickly with innovation and those types of things that, that launch them you know, further and farther ahead. So complacency is a challenge. There's one other two. There's kind of a twin-headed monster, and it's this other concept. Whenever, whenever change is introduced into an organization, the mind goes to one of three places. <laughs> uh, the first is complacency. We just mentioned that. Mm -hmm. and, and complacency, by the way, is it, it, it's just for your listeners to understand this. Um, as I said, it's not malicious or intentional. But what we do when we see someone who's complacent in our organization, what we do is we hit them with the cold, hard facts. And what I mean is that we take an intellectual approach to defeating complacency. So we say, you know, we throw the intellectual part to us. We go after the head. But inside, they're feeling something. And that's the key. Feeling is the key word. They're feeling that I'm not complacent. Mm -hmm. And so when you're defining or explaining their complacency to them, they're saying, as they give you intellectual set and nod to you, they're <laughs> saying, you know, I'm not really complacent. He is. Right. Or that department is. 
I'm fine just the way that I am. And that is <laughs> sheer complacency. Yeah. So that's number one. And so number two is this of the twin headed monsters is called false urgency. Mm. What that is a definition. It's, it's a lot of, it's frantic, busy, fast, moving quickly, a lot of activity, but not a lot of productivity. It's based on fear, anxiety, and a feeling that upper management is just being a little bit unfair in their demands on my time and what they're expecting me to do. And what that causes is people to jump in foxholes and defend mm -hmm. themselves. Um, and so upper management sees people who are falsely urgent and many times get fooled and think, well, look how fast they're moving. Look at all the activity. But really what they're doing, it's a lot of activity, not a lot of productivity. And they're really kind of defending turf. Mm -hmm. And so the brain can go to complacency, false urgency. But where we wanted to go in this leadership change and being an ex exceptional salesperson is a concept called true urgency. And true urgency is the concept that people come to work every single day determined to do two things. Mm -hmm. Number one is to duck the real hazards that exist in the world and seize the real opportunities that are presented every day. Right. And so that's the key. And real is the operative word, right? So mm -hmm. in for, the real opportunities are not tasks and, and errands. They're things that actually move myself or my team or my organization forward faster than the competition if I focus my energy and effort on those specific things. Yeah. Well, true urgency is the... Is the is where we're trying to get people. Yeah, and I like that the, 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 throughout the whole theme of what we've been talking about today, there is this idea of speed and urgency, as you say, you know, true urgency in this case. But that idea that, um, you know, the true leadership, whether it's self-leadership or organizational leadership, is a lot of it is about speed and moving things forward, being nimble, not being stuck in routines or complacent about where you are today. Absolutely. You know, and in leadership, and the key to all that is, and I don't believe that you win with leadership at the top. I, I don't think it's mm -hmm. possible anymore. I see the good organizations that I work with that are really realizing that you win with leadership in the middle. So what they're trying to do is drive leadership down through the organization to help more people lead, give more people skin in the game, give more people reasons to do that. And and I find that, you know, I was at, recently had a, um, was at the Ritz Carlton Hotel in uh in south beach uh working there and um got a conference call excuse me a wake-up call at 7 a.m which i had set for the day before mm -hmm. and the woman answers the phone or i answer the phone the woman says you know good morning this is rita it's a beautiful balmy 76 degrees here at 7 a.m the high's going to be 80 degrees it's a beautiful glorious day i've seen your itinerary i see that you're leaving us and heading off to new york city for work but would you think about staying a couple extra days with us you know <laughs> And uh, I thought, wow, that's a wake-up call. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, what is your name? My name's Rita. Rita, did you do this for the hotel? She says, no, uh, I'm a maid. Uh -huh. I said, really? And I said, we take 30-minute blocks of time, and we don't believe anyone should be awakened by a recording. And so uh, I wanted to just say, hey, I hope you have a great day, and I hope I did my job well. Thank you. And it's been a pleasure. So she hung up. I mean, so... So that's an interesting aspect. And I think staying on the Ritz-Carlton point of view, if you ever stayed there, John, mm -hmm. I'm sure that you yeah. probably have. But, but your listeners, if you listeners have a chance to go, it's a privilege, really. Yeah. And if your listeners do go, anybody who's listening to the broadcast, ask someone like a concierge, uh, an executive going through the lobby, um, someone behind the reservation desk, even a maid, ask them for their multifolded card. And it's, it's, bear with me, John, I've got it right here, as a matter of fact. And the reason I'm going to pull it out is because this is part of their uniform. This little card I just pulled out, and it's multifolded, so I don't know if your listeners can view it, but if I yeah. hold it up, you notice there's a lot of words on the card. Uh, what's on it is there's three, three steps of service, their motto, their employee promise, and their credo. As I flip it over, it's their service values, of which there are 12 of them. And it's also their mystique and their emotional engagement. And so if you ask any of these people as you visit uh, a Ritz-Carlton, mm -hmm. they'll pull this out because they have to have it on and they have to review it before they punch in. And they'll say, many of them will say, hey, Mr. Flick, do you mind if I read this to you before you, know, you go? And you'll say, right. no, I don't <laughs> have the time really. And as you turn to walk away, they'll say, but Mr. Flick, can I at least tell you one thing? And you'll say, yeah, what is that? And they'll say, 
can I tell you what we do? And they will say with great pride, they'll hold their card up and say, we are, ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, <laughs> which says a lot about their people and a lot about the guests that they serve, right? Well, what is yeah. that? That's leadership that's been driven down through the organization that empowers people to lead, even though you may be, your job is cleaning a room. So I, yeah, I, No, I love that because, um, yeah, I have been fortunate and I hope everybody does get the opportunity to stay in hotels like the Ritz-Carlton because, um, to your point, I think the other thing is if you stopped an executive who was going through the lobby and you asked him for something, you know, they're more than likely to go and fulfill that task for you as opposed to pass it off to someone. Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Well, listen, Tom, this has been fascinating, a great conversation. I hope you'll come back and talk more because I know there's a whole uh, lot of other areas we could go into. I'd love to, John. Can I, or can I share one last thing before we part? Absolutely. I listen, hey, real quickly to anybody listening is, you know, everyone who achieves success has a strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And they're doing something better, faster and smarter than somebody else. And the key to converting any information, I think, whether you're a salesperson or a leader or a manager, uh, is it's simplicity. It's been said that uh, complexity is the enemy of execution. So the more that you can boil this information down, whether it be leadership or sales processes, the more that you or your team knows the game is winnable. And so that's my big thing is keep it as simple as possible so more people can attach to it and actually use it as a function of, of getting better in whatever field they're in. So it's been a pleasure being with yeah. you, John. Thanks for the time. Yeah, and thank you. And that's a great way to end. Uh, a great believer in that. We're just making life way, way too complicated. Like, stop it. Get back to simplicity, as you say. <laughs> um, Tom Flick, TomFlick.com, if you want to learn more about Tom um, and all the work he does on, on leadership. And, uh, and again, Tom, it's been great. First uh, quarterback and, uh, you know, great information on change as well. I just want to ask you one last question. What is it really really like to get when your defense lets you down and these huge uh, guys <laughs> jump on top of you? What's that moment like? Well, first, it's no fun. And then when, it, <laughs> when they hit you, it does hurt. And intimidation does work. And uh, I'm happy being in a much safer business. I've been, I've been knocked out five times, John, real quick. Uh -huh. Dislocated my jaw three, separated my shoulder, have broken my ribs, thumb, nose, wrist, and ankle. So I'm happy doing what I'm doing now. But it was a great, it was a great time. Yeah, great. Thanks, Tom. Again, John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline, CRM. See you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks, John. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.